Good afternoon, folks, and welcome to uh, a new week. And a new week brings a lot of great new topics together. Um, today, we're kind of branching out from comms and audio and <laughs> mixing philosophies and all these things to, um, like, what do we say? You know, move from behind the racks to out in the audience, right? To, to think, uh, you know, we when we started this, obviously, we were very technology uh focused folks um you see the whole pst group today and pete and bruce and mac uh, along with uh, our our special guest today john featherstone um we we all started you know we we have a passion for technology that's what kind of brought us to the table but um today uh especially we're we're really focusing not on um the technology but how we're using this technology, right? Um, there's got to be a, a greater purpose than simply I got the coolest comm uh, or the best looking console. Because we all know that audio can't sound good unless it looks good. All right. So <laughs> we just all agree with that philosophy for a second. That's why the audio consoles have to look great. Um, you know, as the uh, audience continues to join um, our, our topic today, the philosophy and ideas for an audience experience at virtual and remote events from the simplest to the most complex. Now, one thing I'd like to point out in that title, because words mean something, uh, at least in my book, and we make a distinction between the virtual and the remote event. And I'd like you to just kind of hold on to that for a while, because you'll you'll see later on where, where that'll come into play. Um, but again, as, as everybody keeps joining us right now, um, Bruce, it's good to see you. You were on with us on the producing for the indie theater. And that was another one of those topics where we said, Hey, you know what? Let's, let's, let's think bigger here. There's, there's more stories to be told about, um, not just the, 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 what we do, but the, how you're doing it right in the theater and, and We've we've been very fortunate to keep growing this. So um, I think today we'll have um, a lot of Q and A. Uh, we're gonna. I was looking at the guest list, and it's a lot of people that that I I know and and you know and everybody on this screen. So um, interact with us, folks. Um, uh, John is always always one for for a riveting conversation. Not to That's put any pressure on you, my man, um, <laughs> but the, the you always are, and I think everybody, as you're tuning in in the questions area, that Mac's going to fill in for you. This is more than just Q and A. Share your philosophy, share your thoughts. We 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 want this to be a discussion. Um, in the second half here, this is about pushing back against norms. Okay, I mean, if we've if anything you know from us, it's not about being normal. Um, that that gentleman in the hair that is not a conventional color should have given you that idea by now. So not you, Pete. The other guy, Mac, who has no hair. Um, Mac, why don't you why don't you take us through kind of the process of interacting today and and what we're going to do? Well, the 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 way to interact with us is through the Q and A window. Um, if you go to your uh, go to webinar control panel, there'll be a little pull down tab that says questions and uh in the in that tab there'll be a window you can type in your questions um as i've said uh many many times before please be specific because it may not be addressed at that moment in time and unless you're specific about what you're referring to it may be hard to understand what you're uh, referring to so Please be specific, as, and again with comments, because we think this this uh, presentation is going to engender a lot of comments and hopefully a lot of questions, which we will be able to uh, discuss more at length. Um, but but when you present it to us, make sure it's going to be clear uh, what you're talking about. I think uh, this, as as Kelly said, this is a kind of a a different road for us, where we're going to be talking really about um, why we do things as well as how we do them and what we do them with, uh, which I think is going to be fascinating. So address your questions through the little questions window, be specific, and we'll be on our way. Bruce? Yeah, you know, Bruce? You're up. 
Yeah. Uh, well, I, I'm very excited about about this uh, about today's meeting. Um, I'm very interested. John is uh, a macro designer, and I'm a micro designer. <laughs> very small shows. Um, so I'm interested in seeing some of the standards and practices uh, that he refers to, and the philosophies of, of approach to uh, production. And I hope they're universal, Bruce. I think some of the things we're going to talk about, whether you've got a group of 10 people or 10,000, hopefully they're universal and applicable no matter what size of group. Sounds good to me. Yeah, you know, and, and Pete, you know, I think, you know, you and I have been on a lot of shows with John before. And um, we're <laughs> uh, one thing we've learned about John is he's very collaborative, right? And, you know, we all understand that we all you need to unite uniformly against the video department. It's nothing personal. It's just how it works um, now. But for those of you in video, you know, we love you um, as long as you do what we want. Um, but, you know, uh, the this this collaboration, you know, um, you know, Pete, we're, how, how do you find um, the challenges? You know, as that comms manager, you're 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 spanning a, a lot of different a lot of different relationships and you're very good at relationships. So why don't you talk about that? <laughs> you know, the, it, it's true. Yeah, at doing comms, you sort of in, end up being in the middle of all of the different departments. Not that they're not talking to each other, but they need you to talk to each other, as it were. And uh, uh, I've always been fascinated with uh, John's attitude. He's more into the equipment of comms than most other people on the show you know the the video people don't really care about comms but he's always got his headset and how he's going to plug it in and read all, <laughs> of this, and, you know, all these different technology going on it's always been great great to work on a show with him um this is our 51st show our 50th show we did on the 50th day of starting this pro project uh, and we've just recently put on our website under the archive section an index of all 50 shows sorted by the subject. So if you go in there, it's right on the website, it shows up in Facebook and on Twitter as well. So if you want to look at all of your read there's stuff. There's an archive? Is this, so we've recorded these and there's an archive of them? Oh, no, no, there's no videos. There's no videos, <laughs> just index of what we've talked about. <laughs> you can look about it. Either you watched it or you didn't. Exactly. So uh, we're going to uh, turn it on over to John, and uh, we'll be back later after his presentation. Go for it. Great. And, and before I kick things off, I, I just want to say sort of on, on behalf of, of an industry that I've worked in always and never known how to do anything else, how much I appreciate, and I think everybody else appreciates, everything the four of you are doing in these really difficult times to kind of draw people together, to share knowledge, to share our passion, to stay connected. And um, and I think it's just brilliant. And I know you're all putting a ton of sweat equity, a ton of time, and not a small amount of your own personal money into making this work. So so I, for one, really appreciate it. And I think everyone should uh, should give these four gentlemen a virtual round of applause. And, and I think in the future, if there are opportunities for us to share some of the financial burden as an industry, we should all be committed to doing that. And on behalf of lights which we're in uh we'll you, we'll john. we'll help you guys in any way we can because it's really critical okay appreciate so, it thank you very much john go for it i'm now going to share my screen i'm now going to start this and if somebody could confirm you're actually seeing my screen that would be fantastic we, we are, are and you okay. can awesome. your audio you it, and you can uh, you can turn off your camera if you'd like great um okay let me do that. Stop sharing my webcam. Okay. Thanks everybody for, for joining us today. Um, and and I'm, I'm going to talk for a little bit and then we're going to open the floor up for discussions. And, and I'm going to talk about three things. Firstly, the why of shows. And and I why do we do productions? And, and I don't mean just to pay the bills, obviously never more than right now. That's critically important. But why as humans do we crave shared experiences? The how of that. How at Lightswitch do we strive to create compelling experiences that really engage our audiences? And thirdly, the now. When we can't do that in the midst of these times with unprecedented use of the word unprecedented, what can we do instead? Um, but first, I thought a little introduction might be useful for those of you that, that may not know me or may not know Lightswitch. 
26 years ago, after more than a decade of touring with bands, everyone from Van Halen to In Excess, The Cure to Janet Jackson, my founding partner Norm and I uh, established Light Switch, a lighting and visual design collective to help people tell their stories. Because whether it's a theme park, a spaceship company or a musician, to us, it's always about the story. Uh, in the last 26 years, we've grown from two guys at their kitchen table into a team of more than 50 designers, project managers, associates, and support staff in six cities worldwide with 10 studios, design, production, logistics, support, a collaborative organization. Uh, let's take a brief look at some of our work just to give you some context. Okay, so now we got the shameless self-promotion out of the way. Let, let's get back to the subject at hand. Why do we like to gather? Why do we feel this deep need to share experiences? And, and I think understanding this helps all of us do our jobs better, no matter where in the production process we stand. We're conditioned as a species to gather and to share from the favelas of Brazil to the European super elite, to the Karo tribe in Ethiopia, Ethiopia we're all called to gather. After all, this shelter in place thing wouldn't be so hard otherwise. But why? What goes on in our psyche? Well, clearly animals, especially mammals, are genetically conditioned to exist in groups. And, and of course, some of this is for nurturing, safety, hunting, but a lot of it is because we simply enjoy it. And there is some good science to support the enjoyment part too. Uh, a study in the journal uh, Psychological Science suggests that shared experiences bring us together in ways even more profound than optimal solo ones do not. To test this hypothesis, the Harvard Decision Science Library uh, took 68 participants and broke them into groups of four. One person from each group was sent solo to watch a really cool video of an amazing magician pr performing incredible tricks for an appreciative crowd. The other three were assigned to watch a boring clip of a low budget cartoon that repeated. Everyone was even told before the experience what they were assigned to watch, whether it was going to be something boring or something super cool and interesting. Afterwards, each foursome was led to a room and told, talk amongst yourselves, share your experience. The researcher left the room and he returned five minutes later. He then gave the subjects a survey consisting of two questions. How did you feel during the experience that took place? And how do you feel about that right now? And ask them to grade that on a scale of one to 100 from no response to extremely optimal. The people who watched the extraordinary video, surprisingly, 
felt worse than those that had watched The Ordinary by more than 10 points. They also felt they'd been excluded from an experience by more than 30 points on average. Why? Because we love sharing experiences and sharing stories, even if they're less optimal ones than a solo remarkable experience. There are a lot of others, but just one more. Uh, a broad 2017 Australian study called If You're Happy and You Know It, Music Engagement and Subjective Wellbeing explored the connection between habitual live music engagement and subjective well-being. Subjective well-being is, is a self-reporting measure that helps psychologists identify effective therapies for things like depression and mood disorders. Engaging meaningfully with live music is one of the techniques that they use, and one doesn't need to be a musician to reap benefits. The study found that while producing music and performing it certainly encourages self-esteem and confidence, Interacting with live music in a group as a fan clearly, demonstrably, and repeatedly is associated with higher, higher mood. It's frankly why I think a lot of corporate meetings use music as a powerful tool. But I think fundamentally, music is also shared storytelling. And we've been doing that for millennia. We're gonna talk about storytelling again in a bit, but like social gathering, it's almost as old as humanity and equally universal. My dear friend and very talented designer, Herrick Goldman, defined this well with a story. Herrick was working in Africa and of course took the opportunity to go on safari. One evening, the group was with their tribal guides and the guides were asking what everybody did. Herrick said he was a lighting designer, blank faces. He said he worked in theater. Again, no point of reference. But when Herrick said he helped people tell stories, it was all smiles and nodding. Then of course, a request for Herrick to tell a story, which knowing him, I'm sure he obliged with enthusiasm and aplomb. It, it's universal. All right, so we've talked a little about the why, to share experiences, to engage, and to tell stories. How do we do that at Light Switch? Let me share three examples with you, two of which Kelly and Pete have been a big part of. Firstly, illumination, uh, tree lights at the Morton Arboretum. Uh, illumination transforms the Morton Arboretum, essentially a tree museum, into Chicago's premier award-winning holiday season destination. It's conceived, creative, designed and executed by Lightswitch in collaboration with ILC and Easy Live Audio. Guests of all ages are invited to explore the winter landscape on a two mile long walk through 75 of the Arboretum's 1700 acres of trees, which are animated with dynamic interactive vignettes of light and sound. Let's take a quick look at another video.
But it's not just twinkle lights on trees. We have a story. The story of celebrating the holidays together, the story of our relationship with nature, and the story of how incredibly important trees are to us. Everything Kelly and I do, everything the team does together, is in service of that story. We plan every minute of an hour-long loop, so not a minute is left to chance, unplanned or uncreated, telling a story with color. The show is sometimes quiet and contemplative with restrained use of color and thoughtful use of text, sometimes celebratory with bright bold colors and uplifting music to incite and infuse, always surprising and full of the unexpected with custom sculptures and whimsy like chandeliers and mirror balls in trees with an ethereal magical soundtrack that Kelly curates. And the bold use of technology, including projection on trees, but always in the service of story and making the scenery, scenery. So it's about crafting an experience that feels compelling and well over a million people have enjoyed the experience and come back year after year. year, after year. So project number two, New Skin Ignite, which both Kelly and Pete have worked on with me. It's a giant business meeting with three major sections, an opening Gwen Stefani show, three business presentations, and a closing event featuring award-winning composer Hans Zimmer and a live performance of the music from his films. All happening in the same arena using the same lights and video equipment and audio system, the team had our hands full and a real challenge to guide the audience, keep them engaged and grounded. But a project this complex needs to focus on story two. And the executive producer, Michael Marto from EBI, a consumer, consummate storyteller himself, challenged us to create a real cohesive experience. With two rock shows, an award show, three business meetings all mashed together, we had to make sure we didn't overload the audience, but took them on a journey with us, a journey with a beginning, a middle, and an end. So that meant my co-designer, Iggy Rosenberg, and I had to carefully curate everything from color to movement to effects to kinetic scenery to make sure we didn't give away everything too soon. So we used tools like color response metrics to ensure the audience felt the appropriate tone for the section of the show. And actually, audiences become Pavlovian really quite quickly. Oh, it's purple. It must be the awards section, and so on. And for the Zimmer concert, we used these remarkable visualizations of the color palette of movies frame by frame as the director conceived the arc of the story. And, and storytelling itself was part of the very fabric of the show. Michael brought together friends and collaborators, Ron Howard and Hans Zimmer, to present an exclusive masterclass on the notion for the audience that we are all storytellers. Because as our client Richard Branson says, everyone that majors in business should also minor in theater. Because every presentation, every product launch, every press conference is storytelling and theater. The show closed with this spectacular custom Hans Zimmer concert because every story needs a great ending, right? And as Hans himself says, I can tell you everything I need to, you need to know in one word, story. And this was something special too, as this is an EVI exclusive, a Hans Zimmer package in a bespoke show just for private and corporate events. Let's take a look. So we ended up with kind of a loop. We had a show with a distinct story, full of stories, telling people how to tell stories that would help enrich their own lives. All right, so what about something a bit more modest? Well, at least at first. In late 2012, my friend and collaborator, Nook Schoenfeld, called me about working with him on a design for an up and coming band called Imagine Dragons. I hadn't heard of them, but Nook sent me some music and it was great. So we decided Nook would take care of the lighting and production design and my colleague Austin Shapley and I would take care of media and visual design. So my first question was, well, what are they about? What do they wanna say? Do they know? Do they have any idea of their story? Oh yeah, they knew. Dan the singer sent me a script for the show. He knew exactly the story he wanted to, set, to, to tell. So Nook and I got to work with some mood boards, which are a super useful way to get clear on story and clear on style. The band were very into illuminated objects, the band's modest mouse and grizzly bears shows, lanterns, but as is sometimes the case with new art artists, they, they liked everything which is great, but not especially helpful in refining the creative direction. So we tried some scenic renderings, which the band liked too. Now remember, this is a production designed to fit comfortably everything, band gear, audio, lighting, scenic, in a straight truck. But as I mentioned, the band liked it, so they hit the road. They started initially in very small venues, 
But the band are extremely astute, astute storytellers. Their songs are almost all biographical or autobiographical. And it was immediately clear that this storytelling resonated with the audience. They wanted more stories. And as the band grew in popularity, we added more LED elements, but still the same set and still the same story. So the show developed, the band got bigger, they told more stories and ultimately moved into arenas. But here's the thing. Every time the band grew in scale, we kept the same story. We didn't have to reinvent. We simply evolved. And other than three small pieces of soft goods, everything that was built for the club tour ended up in the theater tour and in the arena tour. So being true to story and clear on vision not only helps you engage your audience no matter what size the venue, it can also help you spend your money and more importantly, your client's money wisely too. Okay, so that's all well and good, you may say, but we can't do any of that now. That is sadly very true. So what can we do? Well, I suggest we can still tell stories. Everyone seems obsessed with the notion of virtual this and virtual that. And this is the dictionary definition of virtual, almost the same as the thing that is mentioned, created by computers. Uh, none of this sounds terribly interesting, and it certainly has nothing to do with telling stories and creating interesting and engaging experiences. So I prefer to talk about remote experiences. Now, a lot of people I've talked to seem in near panic about this, as it's new and incredibly daunting. I'd suggest that even though it may be a little daunting, it certainly isn't new, especially if you stay true to story. Certainly not a new concept. The Lascaux cave paintings in France from 17,000 years ago, in large part, a remote experience of a hunt. The 11th century bio tapestry, a remote experience about, amongst other things, the Battle of Hastings. It's almost kind of like the world's first PowerPoint presentation. But the biggest and possibly still the most technically complex remote experience was 51 years ago, when one quarter of the world's population watched Neil Armstrong set foot on the moon, and in black and white, no less. So let's just be calm for a minute, stop panicking, and think about what we want to say and why before we get totally hung up on the technology of the how. And I don't know about all of you, but I'm getting really pretty tired of days full of this and evenings full of this. And I think our audiences are too. So what can we do instead, especially if things start to open up just a little bit with physical distancing? As we were going into COVID-19 lockdown, my partners Chris Medvitz and Norm Schwab were working with another consummate storyteller, Marty Brinkerhoff of NBA, on the creative for the Hyundai 2021 Elantra Global Live Reveal. This was originally conceived as an event with an audience, albeit somewhat small, but this pivoted into a remote only experience. And we think this is how we're gonna get out of lockdown as well as how we went into lockdown. This show also addressed a real problem for remote events, distraction. But an in-person experience, the biggest distraction is likely somebody next to you on their phone or even your own phone. But now it's Netflix, kids home from school, spouses home from work, the dog, the list goes on and on. Let's look at what Hyundai created. stage to feel like a real experience there's nothing virtual here it was shot like a live event not a tv show complete with things that we're all familiar with imag voice of god for presenters and playoffs it felt like you were watching a live experience remotely not that you were watching something virtual or digital but it wasn't just a quick let's do a zoom kind of event the metrics were impressive 
154 global media articles, a reach of more than 23 million, and an, a brand opinion scale of 98%. The reveal generated more coverage than Hyundai's 2017 and 2018 auto show press conferences. Nearly 70,000 people watched the live stream, with another 210,000 views in the following week. A lot of the response was that people enjoyed sitting at home, watching something with their families. They created their own small social groups to, ex to enjoy a virtual experience. And equally importantly, if not more importantly, the Hyundai Elantra received more than 10,000 pre-orders on the first day of reservation, with a lot of the country going into COVID-19 lockdown, an all-time record. That number is almost 10 times greater than pre-orders for the previous launch of the car, this occurring in a sales climate where consumer demand for sedans is also sharply falling. So this was no place keeper event. And it is in large part because it was designed by Marty Brinkhoff and the NBA team to entertain, engage, and tell a story in a really cluttered marketplace. Now, of course, there are hybrid remote experiences an introduction of elements like virtual venues and integrating an audience, as in this work by Faber AV in Europe, add a sense of location and context to the story. And as designers, they also liberate us from the constraints of the physical world. This work by our partners at Remote XR adds critical cohesion and detail too. This might look a bit like just tech for tech's sake, but things like interface with the real world in the case of the exercise bike which is streaming real metrics from the physical bike into the virtual world and shadows and reflections on the digital sets all help to add a sense of the real and get the technology out the way of the story. Because it's not like looking at kind of like a digital flat Stanley, but you feel that you're looking at a real person in a real environment. So it's about, oh, skip to slide. So this is about story. And this is a quote I love from one of my favorite stories, the movie Inception. What is the most resilient parasite? A bacteria, a virus, an intestinal worm? No, it's an idea. Resilient, highly contagious. Once an idea has taken hold of the brain, it's almost impossible to eradicate. An idea that's fully formed, fully understood, that sticks right in there somewhere. And for me, that idea that sticks right in there is always the story. So why? Because as a race, we love to gather, we love to share stories, and we love to connect. The how? How will we learn to do this? How do we do this? By staying true to story and honoring our audience's need to connect, to share, and to learn. And what can we do in the now? Well, first, we're going to breathe. Together, we're going to remain safe harbors for calm advice and rational thinking for all of our clients. We're gonna remember that none of this is new. We're gonna focus on remote over virtual and stay honest and dedicated to experience over what is quick or easy. And together, we'll all prevail. And that's how I see some of the why, some of the how, and some of the now. But I've talked for far too long, so let's give someone else a turn and turn this back over to the group. Well, John, uh, as uh, you uh, join us back on screen here, um, I think uh, what you were showing there, the why, the how, the now, right? The the storytelling that we're in, I, I was looking through just to give some propers out to a lot of the people that are viewing this webinar live with us right now. Um, we're also involved in in some of these projects you showed whether it was Hyundai, whether it was uh, New Skin. I see Stan uh, Dickerson, who's the front of house mixer on uh, production mixer on that project. <laughs> and, um, you know, I had the good fortune of being stuck in a TV truck out on the dock monitoring all the outbound feeds to the to the to the languages there. Um, and uh, uh, so so to that point, you know, this this collaborative voice, like a few things I wrote down that was really interesting to me um that if it wasn't for the webinar platforms we might not have been as aware of this but the metrics you know you you pointed to the example of the number of sales right that right, came right. out of that event because at the end of the day um we we do work in service to helping our clients 
sell a product, sell an idea, um, convince their viewers, right? So I, I get that, that at some point, those numbers have to be there. And, um, but uh, I think a lot of times we do that at the expense of the story, right? Mm -hmm. we, we immediately jump, like you said, with the virtual, you know, do we jump sometimes to the very end uh, of that and, um, and do those kind of things? So um, uh, why don't, uh, uh, as we're getting some questions coming in here, um, uh, Bruce, um, why don't you uh, uh, give us a little of your perspective too? I, got, I wish I got to work on shows that big. Some of those things are just spectacular. Uh, John, I was very impressed. And uh, also the architectural aspect of your company looks, looks amazing too. We're very lucky, uh, we've got some amazing clients, yeah. Super. So some of some of your the questions that come in have sort of been uh, more by way of congratulations. Uh, Michael Murphy wrote, uh, "Got it, John," which I presume was a compliment. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, there were some questions about the technology, uh, which is exactly how Kelly started our day. Uh, one, this one was from uh, Dave Early. Question for the video end of our lives was the promo an MOV or an MP4 or some other format? Uh, all of that was uh, was MOVs that were embedded in, in uh, keynote presentations. And I have to incidentally apologize on behalf of the audio friends who put this together, that, uh, that GoToWebinar does many things well, it doesn't stream audio well. So if that audio didn't sound great, that's got nothing to do with Kelly and Pete. That's a limitation, a limitation of the tech. And we'll be providing, you know, in the final version of this, the videos will be replaced in there uh, before they're posted. So everybody can rest assured that, you know, um, the appropriate videos will be embedded there. But um, uh, I think here's a question that I would put out, John, that that I was thinking about um, for just a second, if you don't mind, is is do we do we see a need that are we going to be measured now by how people are engaging? Um, uh on this um meaning are are they going to say oh we had this many viewers and and they stayed for this long or is is that something we have to think about now in our storytelling frankly i hope so i mean i'm 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 a metric based guy i i like metrics you know and and kelly you and i share share the experience of of working on um illumination together and, and one of the things that's great about a project like that is they spend a, a goodly amount of money doing customer surveys that are in depth. What did not, did you like it, did you not like it? You know, they work with this thing called the net producer score, which is basically a way of how do you compare an iPhone with a dinner with a dinner experience with, with a live show? And everything is assigned this net producer score. And, and I love when we can get that kind of feedback because ultimately we're really lucky. We have these great jobs that we love and they're often in service to our own skill our own muse and frankly, honestly, our own ego, but we do them on behalf of our clients. And and if I can know that um, that we're doing a good job, that, that to me is gold. So yeah, if we can do these remote experiences and get more feedback about what works and what doesn't work, um, you know, New Skin's a great example. You know, there's a huge web webcast component. There's tens of thousands of people in the room, but there's literally hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people are watching. And New Skin get all that data and they use it to inform their decision-making process. I'm in favor of that. And frankly, if you're not prepared to be judged, you shouldn't be doing a, 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 a public event or even a private event. And yeah. getting that feedback is, to me, gold. Yes, and, and certainly um, in this new streaming type of world, the metrics are instantaneous. They don't have to take do a survey and wait for the survey results to come back, and half of right. them don't come back, and right. nobody remembers what they saw when they fill out the survey. This is this world. The, the metrics are instantaneous, and and I and I hope that's and I hope that serves our industry well, Mac. You know, for for decades we've all been doing shows and hoping that we're moving the needle and, and leaning in and sleepless nights and time away from families yeah. and hard work and stress as well as creativity and delight to create these experience with the hope that they're moving the needle and and i think when we get the kind of feedback like mba got for the hyundai event where it was really demonstrably clear that it worked that's how we can go to other clients in these challenging times and say look it's right here 
this is what this kind of experience does. We don't have to stay in a boxes on the screen world. We don't have to stay in shelter in place until we can do a show with 20,000 people. There's a middle ground. We can still tell compelling stories and we can prove it. And, and there's a middle ground that could carry into the future. When we do right. come back, when we do come back and we're gathering in arenas again, there's no reason that we could not also extend outward as a live event via what's become the screaming world. Well, and wouldn't it be terrible to go through all this and not learn anything? Yeah. And not be yes. better at what we're doing and not be reaffirmed in our commitment to our industry and our connection with our peers and not learn new techniques along the way. So if we can increase the reach of our clients and they're seeing a better ROI for their dollars, that to me seems just like a, a win all around. And, and the Hyundai event was not, um, at the time when they were producing that event, they clearly didn't want to get an audience in the room, but there were no criteria about X number of people in the room, even though there were some people wearing PPE because of personal choice. But it's super easy to imagine how you could do an event like that with no more than 50 people in the room, with PPE, with thermal scanning. I, I did a Samsung show uh, in February where they were thermally scanning the crew and the audience. So these are the ways that we're gonna have to think smart to practically get our way back out, but we need to still make sure we're delivering a story to the audiences because it's gonna get harder to get to events. People are gonna be less comfortable about being out in groups, some people. Some people are gonna be less comfortable about traveling. So. We want to make sure that the the expenditure reward component tips really heavily in favor of reward. And they go, hey, you know, I had to get on a flight. It was weird. I had to check into the hotel. It was weird. But I went to the room and it whether it's a band or a live experience or a meeting, it was worth doing. And I think that's that's something that's really important for us. Yeah. And, and you said the three most important letters, R-O-I. Um, and uh, return on investment. And that, that ties into a, a question that Joseph put up. Uh, as budget is king in the corporate world, how do we get the client to be believe in the ROI on remote experiences versus a really well-crafted commercial experience or a full CG event, right? And, and that's, a, that's, a, a that's an interesting question, question right? That's a great question. Um, you know, I, and so... Well, I, I mean, I think a lot of it is is dependent on what market the the the, the clients in. For for a tech company, a virtual event might work well for them. That may actually support their storytelling and their and their vocabulary. But I think we we like to see people. We like to see other people. If the fundamentals of what we've all been going through, this shelter in place. I don't know about you guys. I find it extremely difficult. I'm a very social being. I like to see other people, as those of you that work on site with me know, I'm super huggy. I want to make sure everybody's well. I like being surrounded by happy people who are loving what they're doing. I think until we get to the point where we're even beyond the technology of like the movie Ready Player One, where virtual events or, or, or simulated events are indistinguishable from real events, we still need to look people in the eye. We still need to see real people engaged. So I, I think, you know, to judge this, excellent question i think that's up to us as a group to to be to be responsible stewards of our clients vision and to help them understand why it's important to do these things to get into a little of the philosophy you guys all know me i'm, I'm as big a tech junkie as anybody else but to talk about why do we gather like as as groups why do we enjoy the company of our of our fellow humans and how can we expand that to our audience? And I think there's something really interesting that that perhaps accidentally, I don't know if it was part of Marty's goal or the client's goal, that the Hyundai thing captured was this notion of families sharing in the workplace experience. You know, I think for tons of us, one thing I strive really hard to do when my kids were growing up was have them really understand what I do for a living and not be, what does your dad do? I, I think he works at the airport because he's always going to the airport, but really understand my job. And And some of the feedback that I heard from people in the Hyundai dealer group that watched that show was that they enjoyed watching it with their families. So the notion of helping people enjoy what they do as their passions with their family group, I think is an interesting aspect as well. And that's another piece of storytelling that we can talk to our clients about. We've got these smaller social groups, which are the familial groups. How do we reach out to all of them? 
you you know um you know mac you were talking earlier on about how one of your clients is is doing some really interesting philanthropic work just to provide interesting content for people that can be shared that's not totally business focused but is focused more on the notion of shared humanity and i think some of those aspects of what we all do which is basically live communication are interesting too one of the things that i find is interesting in in all these late night shows is how their families are involved in producing it's basically right. their their kids and their wife are the production crew in the room and they involve them in the show more than they ever did True. and i think that's good i mean a bunch a bunch of us you know kelly i i know your your offspring are interested in the business you know my uh, oldest Haley works in the business and is making a name for herself. My youngest is just starting to head in that direction. I think this notion of familial bonding is really super important. You know, we all spend a bunch of time hanging out with the educate family and you hang out with the educate family. You know, I think that's brilliant. You know, that, that, that we have these familial bonds. I, I think that's, that's really important, Pete. Mm -hmm. So to that point, you know, uh, there was a question, you know, I think we'll come back to the RRI one in just a minute because I think there's a couple things that we'll we'll touch on that. But just to get a few more in here, um, Shannon brought up a good one. Can you talk more about live engagement with audiences in remote settings, the two-way tying in with the, the the late night television show would be an example of that, right? Or um, how do we, what, you know, we always struggled with that, even in, whether it was an arena, a ballroom, any any space where we had an audience, getting the audience to engage. You know, we'd hand out the little devices. OK, <laughs> now, you know, and I would play the Jeopardy theme song or some, you know, corny piece of music I could find. And everybody logged in with their one, two, three answer. Right. Um, I think we have an opportunity now to because the audience now has gotten used to interacting two ways, right? Because they've had to in order to have their job, in order to continue to do their 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 work. How what are what are some things we can do differently when it comes to this audience engagement? Yeah, it's I mean it's a, it's another great question, you know, and and I think what we're trying to do as well is we're trying to find solutions in weeks to behaviors which we've established for millennia. I mean, how, how did as a race we establish clapping? You know, because that's universal. Most of us have done world tours with performers and, and produced events in other parts of the world. Everybody claps. We we sort of need the digital equivalent of clapping because, because one of the clips that I, that, that I showed from the Faber AV stuff was essentially the presenter presenting in front of a sea of faces. Now, I think that's super beneficial for the presenter, but that's not really two-way communication. The two-way communication is based on that visceral sense of energy that frankly i'm a junkie for that when you get an engaged audience in a room and they and you get that excitement it, it, it and even in things like illumination you've been there with this kelly it's nothing without the people until you get the people in there it's a bunch of lights and speakers in the middle of a forest it's when you get that sense of, of connective experience and that's why i think this idea of engaging families is interesting because if we as an industry create exciting things for people to view at home that are inclusive, not exclusive, and I mean that we include families to watch it, we don't exclude families. It's not mom takes her computer into the guest bedroom and watches her business download, but we present experiences that people can share. I think that will work in those groups. I mean, we'll watch movies with our families. Everybody gets excited. Everybody kind of, you know, gets swept away in the moment of that. I think. The experience of watching a movie at home is something we can really look at as a way to craft that same level of excitement. That's it's an interesting you bring that up because do we, you know, you hit on a couple things there. One is that we still go back to the energy that comes from being a part of more than just one or two people watching or listening, right? Um, but we know that for for a while that that large scale um, experience is not going to be happening the same way. And so do we do you think that for this to to this point of engaging with audiences in this two way um, communication, do you think some of that is we we encourage um, that client to have more small groups of people to to where 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 that is allowed, where that is is possible, where it's maybe some 
in some ways easier to manage where we have, you know, um, if we had 5,000 people, do we have, um, don't make me do the math, but um, 50, <laughs> 50, 50 of groups of, uh, of, of whatever um, of, uh, that, you know, putting this together, right? And um, do, we, do we now have to maybe look at something like that to, to encourage viewing parties or viewing groups? I, I I think so. I think that's, you know, obviously people are going to at some stage here in different ways, in different parts of the country, in different ways around the world, start to return to the workplace. The vast majority of our clients for a lot of us is in the corporate field. And we're working with people who are transported from their workplace physically to somewhere else to watch a show. It almost feels that we got to bring the show to them. So the notion of gathering in groups, you know, that Tyler, my partner who uh, on the on the West Coast, who does a ton of work with Blizzard, is helping Blizzard find new ways to do this too. How do they broadcast from their facility? So when people are in their facility, you know, Tyler's worked with a team at Blizzard to craft, to transform one of their large meeting rooms at the Blizzard headquarters into a small TV studio. So they can communicate and reach out from their facility to their audience. And and I think gaming multi multi person gaming and motion pictures are really interesting places for us to look as an industry that's frankly taken our audiences for granted and certainly in the corporate world where they show up because they're told to not because they want to um you know and 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 Bruce I think you might have some thoughts about this because you work far more in the in the paying field than a lot of us do because because theater drives you know is based on needing people to actually show up but I think the notion of the way people interact in disparate locations with gaming and the way that motion pictures are generally based on we're going to throw it out in the world and we're going to hope that our story engages. Now, obviously, initially, it's in movie theaters, but increasingly it's in people's living rooms. I think the way to attract those group dynamics in a micro way, not a macro way, is something we're going to frankly have to learn how to do as a business. To your point about um, metrics, in uh, I, I produce off off Broadway theater, which I like to call independent theater in New York City, and often the only metric we get is if someone comes back from intermission or not. <laughs> right. So we often do shows that don't have an intermission for that, so they can't get away with it. <laughs> yeah, don't ask them the question you don't want them to give them the answer to. Yeah. But exactly. but that's the, that's rubber meets the road, you know. I I mean. To be honest, some of the best shows I've seen have been off, off, off Broadway type productions. Frankly, I should find a different career path if I can't take a thousand moving lights and create a different show. But taking eight Lecos and having a budget that is basically how many posters can you stick up on walls around New York City before you get in trouble with the police? That's a lot harder. That's a lot harder from every aspect. And, and I think that rigor of minimalism really, just from a technical standpoint, I think is incredibly defining to, to tell a story on a stage with very little scenery and very little production support. And some of the best pieces I've ever seen in my life are, are of that nature. But the way that you have to reach out, Bruce, is completely differently in terms of, of attracting an audience. And, and I think, Ironically, some of those size of venues, I hope, benefit from this more than the arenas. I mean, if you've got a theater that is, I mean, what are the size of your theaters? 75, 100 people, maybe a little more than that? Yeah, right, right around that. People are going to be going to a 100-seat theater for an off-Broadway presentation months before they're going to Madison Square Gardens for a rock show. Yes. It's, I, it's just, it's guaranteed. So I think there's a huge opportunity for us to support the performing arts at a scale that we are able to, not the scale we wish we were able to. And I hope everybody that's, list, that's listening thinks about that as things loosen up a little bit and these little off-off Broadway theaters that were poorer than church mice at the best of times and, and does everything they can to support them. So another thing I do is, uh, unlike you doing these large corporate events, I do small corporate events. And one of the uh, key aspects of doing small corporate events that I am not seeing it being addressed in the virtual remote world is team building. 
whatever happened to team building? Corporations have spent, you know, many, lots, many, many meetings grouping their people, bringing them in, fly, flying them in from, from all over the country, all over the world, so that they're in the same room together and learning the same things together so that when they go back home, they're on the same page with the corporate philosophy or, or best practices or uh, accounting procedures, all kinds of things. It's a wide range of things. But that's the kind of thing I don't see how we address that. Uh, I mean, yeah, you could send yeah, out you can do an online game. Accounting, yeah. accounting. I'm sorry? I said, yeah, you can do an online game or you can do something digitally collaborative, but that's not the same as, I mean, some of the most amazing team building things I've seen are the ones that have a strong through line of philanthropy. You know, that the, there are a number of our clients who have, who work with local organizations, you know, uh, Toys for Tots. They build bikes for, for, uh, for disadvantaged kids. But, but yeah, I, I think we're going to have to think really hard about how we do that. Uh, and I think, you know, my, my, um, my sister's a, a school teacher in England, and and she's really concerned about not getting back to teaching, but getting back to teaching kids how to be taught and how to learn. And I think some of these things that that we see along the way, um, it's it's equally important to be mindful of the things that we know we can't have a solution for as it is to just focus on the things that we have a solution for. And what I mean by that is there is a huge component of, of collaboration and team building that we're gonna lose with this. You know, I was talking to another friend of mine who plays in a band, you know, and they're geographically scattered. And, and the latency of, of any, even the best, most robust sharing platform makes it incredibly hard for them to do any kind of meaningful rehearsal. And, and, I, and we got a bunch of smart people on the on this this group. I have to believe most of the things that you see are actually curated, that they're individual things that are put together. I can't believe an orchestra can play live over Zoom. If they are, right. they're much better musicians than I ever was. So, so, so yeah. I think to say, Bruce, team building, right, we're going to have to draw a box around that and put that to one side. But when we start events again, we're going to have to understand that our audiences are going to be in the demerit section in collaboration and team building and allow that to be ways to to to, to influence the way we create our events and and i think if they're still listening to us there are a number of producers that i work with still on this and and i think that's going to be really important and i think again as i said before it would be unfortunate to learn from this it would also be foolish to assume that we're just going to be able to throw the switch back and go back to the kind of events and still serve our audiences and I think perhaps that means that maybe there isn't going to be the same kind of closing concert, but some of that money is going to get pushed into team building and collaborative ventures and ways to help people remember how to how to collaborate. You know, we we um, we're very fortunate. We live in a little town called Sedona up in the mountains in Arizona. It's very easy to physically distance up here. I hate socially distancing as a phrase, incidentally, far prefer physically distancing. It's very easy. Yeah. But now we're starting to go back out. Last weekend, uh, last week rather, we went down to Phoenix to move our youngest daughter, who just graduated, out of ASU. It was weird being out with other people. We're all going to have to learn how to be out with other people, and and, and I think we're all going to have to learn to relinquish our judgment and forgive other people for largely behaving in the ways that they that they want to. It's super easy to be judgy about somebody not wearing a mask. I'm affluent, successful, I have means, I could go buy a mask. The guy that you walk past may be thinking about, do I buy a mask or do I feed my kids? You know, so some of these things that we will take for granted, it's a great opportunity to work on our forgiveness and our understanding, but we're going to have to learn how to interact and audiences are going to do the same thing. And even if tomorrow, we wake up in the morning and miraculously COVID-19 has disappeared. We're not going to be able to throw up the doors of an arena and expect an audience to respond in the same way. It's just not going to happen. So we, you know, we talking about storytelling, we're going to have to tell a different story and a story that allows people to introduce themselves to that human interaction in ways that feel comfortable. True. And, and I think there's, there's an interesting one that Stan, uh, 
that, that got posted here. Illumination is interesting to me that it seems like something that can also work during these times. How do you feel about applying some of the principles, meaning audience strolling through the environment, metered uh, entrances, right? We're, we're already experiencing that at the stores, right? So it doesn't seem so odd anymore that um, uh, coming to that, and, and obviously um, with that one being an, an outdoor environment, a um, little different, but um, that idea of getting people back together um, and uh, moving through, right? Yeah, I mean, I, th I think it's a really great notion and, and frankly, one that, that a lot of the less performance-based clients we have are thinking about. The museum, most of the museums we're talking to are thinking about how that shifts the guest experience. You know, most museums these days are, are well, not these days, most museums, period, are kind of rabbit warrens. You know, how do you guide people through? How do you take something that's designed to be a self-curated experience and make it linear? Illumination's super linear. We do another project called Descanso Gardens that my partner Chris Medvitz designs in LA that is super non-linear. So they're thinking about how do you define a path that people can move through? And, and, and I think in terms of overall communication, the notion of how do we break people into smaller groups? You know, when you've got 1700 acres like the Morton Arboretum does, the notion of physical distancing is a bit easier to deal with. I, I think one of the challenges for a lot of us is that we are we're a business which is based on moving mass amounts of people to a place for an experience. And, and some of the conversations I've been having, particularly with producers and end clients, is we need to be mindful of the arc of the whole process. Is As lighting people, we've been doing a lot of research into UVC, which is extremely efficacious. Even though there's no research about COVID-19 in UVC, UVC is what a lot of hospitals and healthcare facilities use for sterilization. It works really, really well. It's extremely likely it will be very efficacious with COVID-19. So there's been some, some discussions about how do we UVC treat a ballroom? How do we UVC treat these spaces in ways that we can very rapidly sterilize these situations? And the clients are going, yeah, yeah, that's great. But for us, the arc of our responsibility to our people begins the minute they step outside their door and goes all the way through that experience until the minute they get back home. And we have to be sure that people are safe through that entire period. So we can sterilize a room, but how do you get 2000 people into a ballroom through the same door? Where, we've all been to hotels all around the world. Where do you physically space those numbers of people? I mean, it's easy for easier for Costco or Home Depot. They've got a parking lot. They can zigzag. I'm sure it's the same for all of us. It zigzags and serpentines its way out. How, how do you do that? And how do clients get comfortable with people going on planes and all that kind of thing? So I think yeah. the planes notion- are be a tough one. Planes are going to be a tough one, Mac. They, yeah, they are. How, how do we create different kinds of experiences? And, and I, some of the clients that we're talking to are saying, all right, how, how do we get the show to the audience? You know, the notion of these pop-up experiences and truck-based experiences and how do we get a thing, particularly in the business-to-consumer space, how do we put the show in a truck? How do we do something that we can take to 50 cities where people can be physically distanced while they're waiting to enjoy the experience. How can we UVC treat that? And we go, all right, well, UVC treating a uh, semi-trailer experience is a different proposition than UVC treating a ballroom or an arena. That seems likely. You know, we need to get people who are actually, <laughs> who are actually able to speak eloquently about light-based sterilization rather than a bunch of lighting designers. But all of this seems practical. And I think that goes to Stan's point about how do we use things that, that are given. Outside space, mobility, physical distancing, feel like they're gonna be criteria for the foreseeable future. So we need to embrace that in our kind of experience planning. Well, and that's, I think you hit a key word there, feel, right? It's not necessarily the actual, are you, um uh uh you know we're not trying to make a medical decision here we're trying to make sure that our 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 customers obviously in, in our pay grade my pay grade 
Mine's about making you feel like you're engaged, right? So that's, there's a lot of finding the comfort, you know, and, and you bring up some good points that Chuck had a question here. How do we reconcile the dichotomy between pushing remote events while advocating for a return to in-person events, right? So um, the answer is C, all the above, right? Yeah. That's, I think that was the whole point of what you were saying, John, is that the two will continue to coexist for the foreseeable future, right? Yeah, it's going to be a fade and not a switch. And and for those of you that will know me, this is super hard. But for me, this process is an exercise in being comfortable with the phrase, I do not have enough information to have an opinion on that subject. And 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 I think we we've we've always viewed the rigging department as where the greatest responsibility lies in our lies in our event for everybody's safety. Frankly, you know, the unsung heroes in the rigging department are constantly hanging thousands and thousands of pounds of hardware above people's heads. And generally, with but a few exceptions, they do it near flawlessly. We, nobody in our business is qualified to speak with authority and, importantly, liability coverage about the physical attributes of making an event safe. I think there's a market for people who are qualified to come into our workspace. We've all worked, a lot of us have worked overseas. It's very unusual to do a show overseas where there isn't a health, health and safety person or a health and safety department. I think we're going to embrace that in the States. I don't think that's bad, but we're going to need somebody to say this is safe and that isn't. But, but I mean, back to Chuck's point, uh, I think we're going to need to create events like um, the Hyundai thing, which pivot well, because as we all know, the timeline for cre for the creative process is long. So we we have clients now who are saying, shit, I got a show in February. I got a show in March. I got a show in April, 2021. How do I start to plan for these? And, and I think we need to do the hope for the best, but plan for the worst with shows that can pivot. And I think delivering remote experiences is is fundamentally different than a virtual event. And I think making sure that we're telling a story that works well presented for 10,000 people, but also works well for 10,000 people watching it, it is maybe more similar than the rush to technology might at first appear. I, I don't know. Maybe, I, I don't know what the group thinks about that. Well, and I, and I think there, there, there will probably be a merging of the two processes as well that, that I think people who have particularly you know in the, in the corporate presentation world they they're going to be learning new things while we're in this non-traveling condition and non-gathering condition they're going to be learning new languages of how to interact with their audience and some of that stuff is going to be to their benefit you know to, to everyone's benefit right and that that we're going to have to find a way to integrate because eventually we are going to gather again, as you said at the very beginning, we are we are um, genetically predispositioned to gather, and and we're more effective, or at least so far in our development, we're more effective communicating when we're in person. So we are going to do that. We are going to gather, and we are going to communicate in person. But a lot, we're going to have to learn a lot of how to do things remotely as well, because, you know, as I said before, it's going to be a while before people want to get back on uh, those sil silver tubes. And and dishes. even when we even when we do start getting back together, the production crews are literally going to want to keep do their production meetings just like this. They're not yeah. going to want to sit around a table and do a reading or or get together after the show. Go back to your hotel room and let's. Yeah. Let's see. I I I beg to differ there. Our, our meeting. I I, I they, they may be told to do that, but I don't <laughs> believe that people want to do that. Oh, I um, live for this. You know. Well, you see, and this this is really interesting with these two different different opinions, and and I think as part of the storytelling and creative process, we're going to have to remember that different people are going to feel about this differently. There, there's there's one person in our ranks who says, not really mixing with people a ton stay home, not have a ton of physical interaction, work from my own home. I've been in training for this my whole life. You know, <laughs> so different people feel about this different ways. And, and I think what's going to be important is 
is um, making people feel like they're engaged no matter how they're, they're consuming it. Uh, Michael Marto, who produced the EVI thing, is always really focused on making sure that the, the, the remote experience, which at, at the stage of doing the, the New Skin show, was basically a web stream, feels distinctively different from the in-room experience and doesn't feel like a second-class experience to the in-room experience. Right. So how do we make that feel differentiated? Is that embracing augmented reality? Is it embracing a different through line? Is it putting a host in that only works with the remote audience? And making sure that people get to pick. Because I think where this is gonna go badly wrong is if people feel compelled to attend a, a live experience and they don't feel safe. Because I, I don't care how good the story is, if somebody doesn't feel safe in that way, um, they're not gonna listen to one word you have to say. So I, I think a lot of this is gonna be thinking about parallel paths. How do we deliver a compelling in-room experience? For, and this is frankly gonna be a challenge for producers. How do we develop a compelling in-room experience and how do we predict how many people we think are gonna show up and how do we provide an equally engaging, compelling experience for those who are watching remotely? There, there are some answers to that, but Mac, to your point, I think we're going to learn really interesting and innovative and ex frankly exciting ways to do that. Uh, I'm by nature an optimistic person. I 100% I, I believe we're going to come out of the other side of this together. It, there's a lot of hardship between now and then. I'm deathly afraid that the entertainment industry is gonna get somewhat marginalized and most of civilization will go back to business as something like normal. And we'll all be over here going, hang on a minute, we're still not doing any events. People aren't going to see bands. People aren't going to the theaters. And they'll go, yeah, but 95% of business is back to normal. But that too will pass. Um, but I hope that we find ways to be better at what we're doing not only in terms of the product we deliver, but also, and this is probably a whole nother webinar, how do we get a voice? You know, we're a giant industry with no voice. You know, um, uh, you know Michael Strickland, who owns Bandit, um, a lighting company, has been really good in terms of getting the position of the entertainment business in front of, of legislators. And, and, and some of Michael's feedback has been, they're aghast at the notion that people don't get paid when they're not working. They're aghast at the notion that if you don't, what do you mean you don't get paid if you don't do the show? Is there not a contract? And Michael's like, yeah, but I can't A, sue people that don't have any money, and B, I can't sue people to try and recover $100,000, even if it's 50 clients, all of whom owe me $100,000, and C, I would really like to work for these people again, and they're in the same kind of problem that we are. And these, And the lawmakers are like, this is, mind-blowing to them that this is the way our business works and and i think we would be well as an as an industry and this is a big bucket to remember what this feels like when things get better and go yeah the notion of you know and it, it really reminded me what well, a lot of the corporate meetings we do you walk past the political action campaign um booth for whichever company it is and i'd never re it never really sunk into me how critically important that is but we 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 need to have a voice. There are lots of people who are sole proprietors, who are 1099 contractors, and, and especially Bruce, I suspect in, in your part of the world, who are totally falling between slipping between the cracks, who are getting no help and are probably not gonna get any help. Um and that that's not right. Everybody's paying, well, theoretically, everybody's paying their taxes. Everybody should be being equally looked after, and it shouldn't be <laughs> says he who's frequently the loudest voice in the room. The loudest voice in the room shouldn't be where the money's going. True. That's but I got and that, a hell of a tangent there. Where did, I, where did well, that one yeah, yeah. No, I'm That one's a hard one to argue with you about because um, it, it's a true statement that, um, but to your point, I think what a uh, few things I would take away from that that kind of tie into some of the questions we have here, um, that one of those is storytelling isn't just for entertainment storytelling is for selling yeah. those people that can make this compelling argument to those end clients that that get that because art is something if we we know from the history of man right that 
that art and and has that grew out of that need to express yourself right so we know this is coming back because it it was developed you know centuries ago on on many levels right when you think about the the amphitheater days right um this performance is nothing new to mankind right how we do it different little different story but um you know to kind of pull that back to to meeting people's needs well that's getting more work and how do we get more work well unfortunately the people that are online with us today a lot of those producers were looking to you that that's the unfair <laughs> part of it i'm just going to tell you right up right now you are our first line right it's it won't be the government it's not going to be um, um our friends we do consider you our friends um but you're the ones that do that um you know television i think we have a unique moment right now to learn from every marketplace that has found success and failure and and to pull those and you know we used to say we're going to cobble this together well i don't believe it's a cobbling anymore i think there is a clean joining of these various disciplines whether that's theater whether that's, that's television true. production whether that's sports production whether that is um live events um uh concerts we we need we we are so privileged to have been exposed to so much of this mac will know from the tonight show that the one of the most boring places to be is in a TV studio during the taping of a show, right? Everybody watches a show. I'm not saying the Tonight Show is boring, but when you watch TV being made, it's kind of like you know, understanding where everything comes from, right? That you are um, consuming, and and you go, oh wow, that's different, right? The viewer at home, it's like, oh my god, this is the best show I've ever seen, right? And you you and I are sitting there going, do you know how many takes it took to get this or that, right? right? Um, I, I, it's what we're doing right now. This kind of show is like backstage at a live TV event. We're just now cobbling together a kind of a show <laughs> with with no great success, as it were. Well, well, I don't know about that, but <laughs> I don't know. I don't know if I'd agree with that. The, well, with the yeah. thing, Pete, but yeah, but you're right, Kelly. But that's because they're myopically focused on story. Uh -huh. You know, I mean, yeah, TV yeah, and yeah, motion yeah. pictures, I mean, I, I've not done, I've done like this much movie stuff, but what's clear about doing movie stuff, and I suspect it's probably the same with, with episodic television as well, is forget about having any idea of the story while you're making it. It's going to be all, you're going to shoot, shoot scene one, then scene 32, then scene six, then scene 25, then scene nine, but the story is holding it all together. And, and that's, I, I, I mean, Mac, you've done way more TV than, than I have, but I suspect that's what they do as well. There are people there who go, okay, it, this is about story. And and frankly, I, I think in those genres and as well in certainly our experience in, in, in traditional theater, that's, that's a lot of the producer's role in those genres is saying, yeah, we're going to make sure that we don't go broke doing it, but they hold people accountable to the notion of story, even the director. You know, and and I think to to think about how we can, as a group, help the people that are on this this uh, this webinar and the rest of our producers maintain focus on story and use our tools and our techniques and our decades of experience to help them stay focused to story. This is a team effort. You know, we're not going to get out of this on our own. And 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 Kelly, you're right. We we are dependent on the producers to find the work and help us out of this. But but we're we're in the trenches with all y'all too. You know, exactly. We're here, you know, we wanna try and, and help to bring all these different experiences and uh, people around that. You know, uh, James made uh, an interesting uh, point here about uh, when we design and develop a plan to engage our audience online, we often think outside the box, which is what you have to do, right? But the point being, that he was breaking up here is that going into smaller group discussions, um, the panel discussions, breaking into these these bits of information, maybe where where what we would maybe have thought about as breakouts in the past are about saying, okay, 
not just replicating what we did in a facility, but rather that idea of I need to go one to many, then I need to go one to several, then I need right. to come back to the one to many. And this is this is a lot of work. And another question was around what technology exists out there that's more latent, less less latency, right? The magic word that everybody wants to be able to do. How can I do this instantaneous so I can perform with a symphony on Zoom? Well, the short answer is you can't unless yeah. you've got yeah. billions yeah. of dollars, and in which case you still aren't because there's still some technology <laughs> thing, right? right? The only reason you need the billions is so you can put everybody in a bubble um, and put them in the same room. But um, uh, to his point, I guess the idea of bite-sized time chunks is giving them two ways to communicate, right? Compelling them to be a part, right? Is that a wrong statement? If you know, and normally no. in a theater we would say, you know interact as you want is it wrong for for an employee employer to say to a senior executive hey if your group is not engaged i'm holding you personally responsible for that is yeah i mean i i think it goes to you know i i mentioned this in 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 the uh in the presentation uh richard branson who 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 is a deeply performance based guy you know um he's kind of all was on, but but I think he's right in what he says is that everybody that does a, a, that majors in business should minor in theater and probably frankly the other way around, um, because it's about communicating. It's about making sure that you know how to engage people. So yeah, we've all been in rooms where we've been like, oh my god, this guy is the CEO and he's just <laughs> terrible. He can't speak, he can't hold the room, he can't engage. And equally, we've also been in the presence of greatness where we've gone, oh, well, I totally understand Mark Benioff. I totally understand why Mark Benioff is the billionaire that he is and is the powerhouse that he is behind Salesforce. See him in a room, amazing. Speaking completely extemporaneously with eloquence and while he's walking around the room, because God forbid you can get him to stay on the damn stage. But, um, but that accountability, Kelly, if that's something that comes out of this, then that's a that's a good thing. You mentioned the tech piece. I, I'm sure most people know that Zoom, and and I don't know for sure, but I can't imagine the rest of them haven't done this. There there is a there is a breakout capability in Zoom. You can do breakout meetings, mm -hmm. and then also interesting, you can force people back out of the breakout. I, I think that's interesting. I think this notion of an experience that's delivered to small groups is going to be where we really start to move the needle. I, I, I don't know about the rest of you. One of my earliest memories is gathering. We, at the time, we didn't have a TV. Going to our next door neighbor's house in the UK to watch the moon landing. And that sense of shared palpable ex, uh, experience it stuck with me, has stuck with me my whole life. I think getting small groups together is going to be the way this, this works. Um, for some companies, that's going to be really challenging. For a lot of companies, they're going to be sending people back to their offices. And I think to say, just stay in your group, we're going to deliver something compelling to you, uh, I think is is a really interesting path forward. Yeah. Um, the, the collaborative nature of our business, I think, um, uh, speaking directly to producers, is about reaching out and partnering um, I can speak for myself that um, obviously I'm very passionate about these kind of topics, but I'm, I'm more passionate about sharing experiences from all different facets that, that both work and don't work, right? And this remote production, another question came up around um, using remote production techniques that we see, whether in, in sports or television. And I think that's very valid that, that we can apply a lot of these, these same techniques um, but again, goes back to this narrative. Chris brought up a point. Chris Wilson says here, how do we change the conflicting narrative that entertainment pros are either rich celebrities or artists and should get a real job? Um, uh, yeah, uh, that's a kind of an interesting statement. Well, I think for those of us that have been in the presence of people like that, it's a very real job. I mean, the, the the bands that I've worked for have, without exception, been really hardworking. Um, now, I think there's an, another discussion about income equality and making sure that people are paid more equitably for what they do. I, I don't do a ton of sports work, so I can't speak to athletes. But 
certainly looking at the physical condition of them, I, I think most of them are not sitting around on their couches waiting for game day. I think they're working pretty hard themselves. But I think one thing that's interesting about this process to me from a from a uh, sociological standpoint is it feels like there's been a bit of a level set here, right? Everybody's in their dining rooms or their kitchens or their living rooms or their home offices or whatever. So I, I, I wonder if that's going to answer some of that by by the, you know, I, I, as as I've often said, there, there's doesn't matter what class you are on the plane, everybody's going to meet up again in baggage claim. You know, this doesn't matter whether your business class of in the air, maybe your bags will be off like 20 seconds quicker. But everybody has to go through those pinch points. There feels like some of that with this, that everybody is dealing with this together. So I'm not I would hope that we have a better understanding of each other's humanity for this. And I think some of the celebrity based stuff that I've seen content wise, it's been really, really interesting and really down to earth and really humble and right sized and really human. Yeah, I, I agree. Um, let me ask you about this then, though. Do you feel as though people are now going to, um, you know, we've seen we've seen the 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 flattening of our management structures, whether that's in in television, entertainment, or, or the corporate, where where oh man, look at that, my boss is having the same exact problems I do. His kids are running through the shot, and his dog is barking. And, oh, my God, I'm so glad that they have exactly the same problems I have. But do we reach a point now where we have to say, okay, we need to, there's a certain amount of business that we need to get back to, not business as normal, but a perception of some normality in areas. And do does that mean a more traditional stage presentation? Does that mean an executive from the headquarters? you know not in their pajamas anymore not being you know the Gotta same as you and me and going hey i'm here because we need to preserve work or we need to preserve jobs and this is an important role that i have and i'm going to give you that impression is that part of the storytelling I, I i think so you know i mean obviously there's super practical reasons why we put the person you're supposed to be listening to at one end of the room slightly elevated and brighter than the rest of the room but I think there's an opportunity to spring back from what we're doing now. And, and I think there's credibility through the delivery of production. And that's why I am disappointed by some clients with the way they're not using this as an opportunity to really embrace the best possible way to deliver their message and delighted with other clients. One of our, one of our tech clients is in the process of, of reframing literally their CEO's garage as a small scale TV studio. So again, in conjunction with, with some of the, his family so that he can deliver addresses that feel like exactly like you're saying, no dog in the background, no kids running around in a way that feels like it has a bit more gravitas. And I think that comes from a way to go, all right, well, that's important because there's some messaging there. You know, there, there's there's a wrapper around it. And and I think what we will do is, is frankly, we provide a wrapper for the story. You know, the story's got to be in the middle, but most people on this in, on this, this webinar aren't the story people. Most people on this room are the, all right, we're going to take this from you and we're going to use our skill to help you deliver it. I think what's happening is, and certainly what I feel is, the story's leapfrogging us. And I'm sitting in the middle going, wait, hang on a minute, now this is going right past us and we have all of this skill set to help you execute this. And I understand the need to move with with speed and decisiveness in the moment when when we most of the country went to shelter in place. But now well, let's take a breath and nose breathe a little bit and figure out how to engage all these super talented people in creating something where people go, you know, I'm going to sit down and watch this because I want to, not because I'm told to. Does that make any kind of sense? It, yeah, it does. It does. You know, um, uh, Matt, what do you think? I mean, you yeah. work, you, you know, what do you, when's, when's broadcast TV going to start to move back into a studio environment? And when's the novelty of the from Conan's kitchen going to wear off? Because I sort of think it kind of has already. Yeah, I think certainly from the viewpoint of the production people, it's already worn off. Yeah. Uh, um, 
Because and a lot I, of the production is being done by the people at their homes, not by the production crew. Well, but the production crew is still switching it. And, and I mean, it's not, it's not, there's still a team behind that working. It's not quite as hands off as they would have you believe. Exactly. Yeah. And, and uh, I'm mostly working these during this, this uh, situation in a corporate television studio. And it's amazing to me when we interact with people from other corporations, how low the production values are at other companies. I work, I'm work. i working with a big financial company in New York and they have a TV studio in their headquarters. There's only 70 people working in a 46 story office tower. Wow. 98% of the corporation is working from home. The CEO has an entire floor of the building that he's the only person on. The president has an entire floor. He's the only person on and the financial officer has a floor. And, and then there's uh, of the 70 people in the building, 35 of them are security and cleaning staff. And there's some food service people, but there's no, real and you know people working in the financial industry Work really bees. right yeah in that in that building except for a television production crew that i'm part of and um we did uh we did a couple of weeks ago a a um sort of a summit with the white house and there were the ceos of banks all over the country you know, talking to the president and of the entire operation, there was maybe, I don't know, 20 other CEOs presenting plus the president and a few, and a, and a few other officials. We were the only presenter with any production values. We presented from a television studio. The CEO came in, sat there, address the camera. Everyone else was in their kitchen on their laptop. The White House, unbelievable. <laughs> totally out of control. <laughs> it's, it was the regular, they were at a big conference table sitting six feet apart, one microphone on the table. And, and progressively more inaudible as you go down the table. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And I mean, did nobody put any effort into this uh but but these things can be done i mean it's we do it and other companies can do it and they can and they can you know as we develop new strategies for interacting with the people we need to interact with i think there will be more of this i mean it, it doesn't have to be crap it can, right which is what it largely is now. It, it largely was a bunch of people that looked worse than the five of us do. Oh, that's I mean, a pretty low bar. <laughs> yeah, it is a pretty low bar. And so, 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 so Mac, here's, here's a question for you. Um, I, I would like to believe as a production professional that that matters. And I would like to think I that even though people can't say, oh, but that's because there was one mic in the middle of the table or that's because the lighting's crappy or whatever. But people know, you know, we we've been doing a number of remote kind of consult consultations with clients to help them improve their visual presence with Zoom. Oh, you've got your back to a window. Let's turn you 180 degrees. Let's uh, let's elevate your la your laptop a little so oh, you're not please, all elevate your laptop. And, right. And people are universally really pleased with the results, but they universally can't put their finger on what was wrong in the first place. And right. and I and I think and I would hope much as a lot of the time people can't put their finger on why they don't like a dish. I mean, sometimes it's super obvious. It's not cooked. It's too salty, whatever. But most of the time when people go, you know, how's your dinner? I don't really like it. Well, what's wrong with it? I, I, I just don't really like it. I would like to believe that's the same with production deliverables is people can rarely say, unless they're production professionals, it's because of X, Y, Z, but they can go in, but it, it, it didn't engage me. It wasn't interesting. I, I would hope that your employers are smart, clearly your employers are smart enough 
to realize that and understand that there is more gravitas and um, and presence to a better presented uh, production portfolio. Yeah, it's and it's it's. So why it's, the hell are more people doing it? <laughs> pardon me. I said, so why the hell aren't more people doing it? Yeah, I, I, I don't know. I can't understand that. They, I don't think they're even aware of how amateur they look. Or is it that, um, uh, is it the fact that they didn't have these measurements in place, right, that we have now? Can we, can we quantify things better? Because if we know that at the end of the day, it comes down to moving that money needle. Right. And we and rightfully so. I, I get that. We need to we need to sell products. We need to sell services. And um, maybe part of what we have to embrace is is what role does each of our whether it's our industry as a whole or whether it's our discipline need to be able to say, hey, I have a way of capturing this right component and, and helping you to make this decision. As as one person said, you have two two components to every decision, the rational and the emotional, right? And show business is a lot about emotion, right? But the rational of it is the finance, right? Um, uh, to I'm going to bring up a, um, a kind of a statement question that Todd put out here. Um, thinking ahead, outdoor spaces being more conducive to putting more people together. Does it make sense for corporate shows, meetings, team buildings, et cetera, to migrate towards summer months when outdoor venues are usable? Things are usually quieter for the corporate um, and uh, which is slower. Eventually becomes a busier time of year for corporate productions and two to do bigger shows, larger events. Uh, eventually have an opportunity to get started by using large outdoor spaces, right? Um, you know, corporate, maybe the, corporate palooza. I don't know what palooza, it's, right? You know, put myself in the face. <laughs> do do we actually give people more um, uh, sense of of safety or, or not safety? But do you know if people feel safer in that environment? Is that ultimately assuming that you know we have all these federal guidelines that are followed? Um, that seems like an interesting um, thought. Yeah, I, th I think it's a really interesting idea. I mean, I, I would suggest there are still, there's still part of that arc of safety. The, the cradle to grave, well, that's probably really the wrong expression to use right now, but the front door to front door arc of that. And, and I think, yes, I, I would hope that would be the case. I love doing outdoor events anyway. I, I think from some of our corporate overlords, security of intellectual property, is going to be a challenge for, for a lot of clients. Mm -hmm. they, they're going to have a hard time being comfortable that their IP is protected when they don't have a physical structure blocking it. And I think some of the same fundamentals about how do you get, let's pick a small, a small big event, if that makes sense. How mm -hmm. do you get 3,000 people into Ravinia to do a corporate event through basically the same funnels and I think there's going to be some fundamental redesign of the way people uh, think about buildings. I mean, some arenas are easier; they're they're multi-doored. But I think some of those pinch points. Do you you know? But I would love to see that. The challenge with obviously summer months is is for the for the for the the entertainment side of our business, the real entertainment side. Most of the existing facilities are pedal to the metal through the summer months. You know, amphitheaters. Um, you know, spaces like Ravinia. Uh, in if, in Chicago, for those of you that you know, it's that aren't familiar with Ravinia, it's a summer music festival space. That's not to say there aren't a lot of other spaces. And and again, I think this is where we need to come up with a portfolio of solutions that we can go to customers and say, your own not your only choice is not don't do an event or do a Zoom call. Here's a whole different range of options. Some people in the automotive space, I could see them loving doing outside events because what you can do with vehicles oh, yeah. is often yeah. limited by what you can do inside. To, particularly but, if you're going to the heavy truck market to do a show outside, they'd be like, oh, absolutely, that's going to be brilliant. Right. The agricultural equipment companies and the construction uh -huh. equipment companies already do that. I mean, ride and drive is outdoors. Right. And and uh, car companies could do the same thing. So, so I think it's a great point. And, 
<laughs> yeah, and I think we can as a group either say, all right, we're going to sit around and be sad and wait for things to normalize, normalize if that even ever happens, or we can be innovative thinkers and come to our clients with, and I mean our end clients, with, with a whole range of different options from a remote experience to a hybrid experience to an outdoor experience to a small group experience and see what sticks because I think that's part of the challenge here too is, is we've all got pretty good and, and, and I know a lot of us are very fortunate to have year over year clients where we get very familiar with what they like and what they don't like. Well, mm -hmm. now it's as much a discussion about what can you do or what can you not do. So to reframe that decision with a whole different group of criteria, to me, seems like a great opportunity. That excites me. The thinking out of the box, the what's bold. You know, Kelly, you and I do this every year with Illumination. What can we do that we haven't done before? How can we surprise and delight people? How can we make them go, oh, well, that's, I wasn't expecting that. That's kind of cool. I think and it's people, in, people in the production business who think that way. And right. And I think we need to get out there more and present new ideas about how about how to address audiences in in new ways. I think you're absolutely right. Absolutely, and um, you know a lot of a lot of the statements that are a lot of the things that are comes um, questions are really more more statements around that. You know that are all a lot of agreement around that, you know, just when the dust settles, companies see the cost savings on the remote business model, this becomes kind of permanent. So meaning this, um, this, what appears to be a singular path right mm -hmm. now will continue to be a part because they found success with it, right? So all the more reason to help them find success and hold on to that so that when we do transition back, everything's going to be that parallel path. We've talked about that, like every every discussion somehow always gets in with the idea that there's going to be two paths to everything we do. Um, and uh, going going forward with that, um, I was just making some notes here that that seems to be a recurring theme um, uh, that the engagement methods that we use whether that's going to be small to large groups or taking the large group and then breaking them into the small groups, coming back together, that we do this virtually like with Zoom, um, that it has to be measurable, right? Every Everybody's comments in some form or fashion come back to metrics, 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 measurable metric, metric, metrics, right? Because we'll have spent the last eight months with people being able to print out spreadsheets for days though they won't know necessarily what it means or does but there'll be numbers there so i'm thinking we need to get spreadsheets going right away right we're just gonna be making up spreadsheets right uh, next practical you know, show talk brushing up on your excel skills that's uh, right just just make it up right but but i i think there's a lot of that information available already certainly a mm -hmm. lot of the clients that that i work for they do pretty robust post-event surveys you know, and, and and certainly, I mean, if you look at the entertainment side, m most big tours are really interested in what um, the audience thought. And Live Nation do incredible in-depth analytics of what audiences liked and what they didn't. You know, it's why they're so, one of the many reasons why Live Nation is so successful is they're really astute at figuring out what people like and what they don't like. And that's one of the reasons why they're having a hard time pivoting, because they had a really strong path about what people liked. But there, there was a, quite a lot to unpack there, Kelly. But but one of the things that is going to be the same for all of us is we've worked in a world where 100% of the budget has generally gone into the room. Uh, there might be a live stream peeled off here and there. And at the moment, 0% of the money is going into the live room. What I think is sure is we're never going to go back to the point where 100% of the money goes into the live room. There's always going to need to be going forward a plan B. Um, and that plan B may be, let's just webcast the show, but there's always going to be some attrition of that budget. I don't believe live events are going away. Maybe I'm naive and, and I'll be proved wrong, but but post dot-com bust, everybody was like, oh, we're never going to do shows again. Post 9-11, everybody was like, oh, we're never going to do shows again. Post Credit crunch 2017, 2018. This is the death of the live event. I still believe in my core that there is something fundamental about gathering groups in rooms 
in spaces, in theaters, in arenas, in amphitheaters, that is fundamentally part of the human condition and people are still gonna wanna do that. And ultimately, even the most cynical corporate client is gonna understand that people are gonna pay more attention, they're gonna have a better experience and they're gonna take more away by doing a live event than by doing just virtual. Now that's a pendulum swing as well. And we're gonna to have to work with our clients to, to help them understand that. And to, again, some demographics, you know, that's why earlier in the presentation, I dug into some of these surveys. I've been doing a ton of reading into the, into the study of why people resonate with live experiences. That's demographics. You know, this is, you know, when, when the psychology department at Harvard is compellingly explaining that live events have a profound, when shared experiences rather, have a profound effect on people's enjoyment, you can put that in front of any CEO in the world and they, they may not totally understand, they may not totally choose to embrace that path, but they can't discount the veracity of that information. Right. And we're so, going to have to go out and sell ourselves a bit. We're going to have to sell the live event back. We just are. I believe in it. I know you four do. I know everybody that's on, I hope everybody that's on this webinar does. We, we believe in it. So we're going to have to get back out there and be comfortable, not saying, hey, my dad's got a barn and my mom can sew, let's do a show. But here's why we should do it. Here are the reasons. Here are the, And yes, there's tons of metrics about virtual events, but there's also tons of metrics about live events fundamentally the human condition but right. what we're so, all learning by this being locked up is what the non-live events are we're experiencing and i think that the shows are always going to be a combination of that in the future because just like uh esports they have a thousand people coming to see the show and six hundred thousand watch it online 100%. that's just the way it works and the rest of the industry may want to go that direction too can't hurt to stream your live event you're spending all that effort on. I couldn't possibly agree more. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, you know, the few things I wrote down there science, right? What have we been hearing over the last weeks? Trust the science, trust the science, trust the science, right? And um, the, what we saw in your, in your color chart, right? was and, and what you talked about from harvard were scientific studies oh yeah right? i'm a nerd yeah right so if we again part of that quantification isn't just about excel spreadsheets right a lot of this quantification is about understanding what motivates people to do something because at the end of the day we we whatever we're doing whether we're in live events broadcast doesn't matter we are we are in the business of getting someone making a compelling argument for someone to do something, whether that's simply to participate or in the case of Bruce in theater to not just listen and watch, but perhaps take away a moral of a story that causes you to act or think differently, right? And, and that's what, wasn't that the intent of so many theater? And, yeah, and even in corporate theater, it's it's the point is to get people to think differently. You know, either they're gonna they're gonna think about what you're presenting. I mean, that's that's why you do it. Yeah, and 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 ultimately, I mean, you're right, Mac. And ultimately, we we sell stuff. Whether we're selling, in Bruce's case, an experience. Mac, in your case, uh, viewing a TV show, or largely for Kelly, Pete, and I helping people sell their products, that's emotional. That's rarely a completely rational, empirical decision. It's about having people feel a certain way. You know, when when people come to see your productions, Bruce, they want to feel a certain way. Maybe they don't get that because that's part of the notion of the production that you have people leaving feeling differently than they thought they were going to and that's part of the wonder of live theater is when you get those pivots you know and obviously mac you know it's, it's you know better than anybody you know broadcast tv is also about selling stuff it's about selling an entertaining experience that also sells the advertising right. and and for those of us that are vested in both the corporate world and the entertainment world bands are interested in selling their music and selling their live experience and god knows selling their t-shirts Corporations are interested in selling their products. Apple 
don't sell iPhones by trotting out a bunch of statistics. They sell iPhones with a lifestyle promise. Yep. Same with all of our clients, and that's emotional. So that's go only gets conveyed in a way that connects with us viscerally. So yeah, the stats are super important, and we got to make sure that what we think we're selling and what we think we're doing is actually what we're selling and what we're doing. But we're creating an emotional ex emotional experience, and I don't think there's any better um, experience drug than being in a room full of people who are really loving the show. Uh, you know, I that that that's that's my drug. You can keep your cocaine and your heroin and your pot and your whatever. That moment when the house lights go out in the show and the audience goes nuts. That's my drug. When you get to the end of the show and everybody leaps to their feet, which happens in corporate shows as well, and clearly had something meaningful, that's my drug. When somebody goes to a show and can't wait to get on Facebook to tell somebody else how great it was, that's my drug. I'm a junkie for that stuff. I'm a li I'm a drunk. I'm you know. Yes, my name is John Featherstone, and I'm a live event addict. <laughs> right. Well, when when live theater comes back, and if they revive it, which I think they may. Go see American Utopia. Okay. <laughs> I will so, take that recommendation from you. Completely you blown go. away by that. Yeah? Yeah. The David Byrne uh, show. So Joseph made a statement. He's like, during this time, can we continue these meetings in smaller think tank formats to bring forth more brilliant ideas from the peanut gallery? So I think um, I'm going to say yes. Yes. Because we can. So why not? Um, and this is one of them. The peanut gallery is out there watching us, and we're hoping they <laughs> exactly. harvest their ideas. Yeah, and we're, we'll are we just keep doing these. Um, uh, does John, this is from Eric uh, H., uh, does John have a white paper elevator pitch to help all positions be able to sell live events? Um, I do, and I will send it off to you, Kelly. And yep. if you want, you can stick it up on the, uh, on, on the, the, the website. Perfect. Yeah, because I think, um, you know, uh, the, that uh, this is the kind of contagion we like, right? The right. idea that, contagion you know, contagion of ideas, you, like I said, the, the thing from excitement, from right? And um, that theater, when you're in theater, right? Um, yeah. We can spread good and we can spread good things just as easily. Um, uh, just kind of scrolling. In that regard, through. the other thing I want to throw out mm -hmm. let's get comfortable sharing our failures. We're an industry that generally tends to go, oh, that didn't work very well. I'm not going to do that again. But but we're in uncharted territory here, and we and we need the industry to succeed. So let's be comfortable saying to each other, hey, we tried this, and you know what? For the love of God, don't do that, because it was a really bad idea. Let's share our failures and our victories, but it's really important that we get comfortable with sharing our failures, because we all need to elevate. You know, the it's a cliche, but a rising tide does float all boats and we need to float all production boats so the quicker we can get the tide rising the better for all of us absolutely i cannot agree there uh more i should say um finish my thought i, yeah. I, I generally don't care whether you agree or not kelly i know but well, that's what i love about you um as long as the audio is good that's all i care about 100%. Um, as long as you agree with audio um uh isn't low production acceptable because it's a new circumstance? Back to your point, Mac, about the what we're seeing in these production values, right? Where we're, we've talked about the bar getting lower, the perception of it, right? Um, but as this continues, uh, Stan said he thinks as it continues, I think we will see an increase, right? We're going to see that that production value go back up, right? That hopefully this is a momentary, just right. you know. In the cycle from, from your lips to the production god's ears stan yeah let's see here oh another person um uh, michael said this should be a ted talk in my humble opinion I'm, <laughs> i would agree with you michael i think this would be a, a great ted topic yeah. um let's see um we talked about the seismic shift and um and and in the economics of scale right that um the the bottom line is the one i will take one uh i will disagree with you on one statement you made earlier john and that is you said um the the remote being a plan b and i believe it's actually we need to design it as a component of plan a and oh, there 100%. is only yeah. 
plan A. And yeah. plan A has everything built into it. And mm -hmm. and yes, you can take pieces from that. We have to be careful because that, you know, the that that instability of creative starts to 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 fall apart. But man, if we build both at the same time. Yeah, I, I think that's part of us learning a new production language that that new ways to address an audience, you know, who may not all be in one room. And, mm -hmm. it, you know, we don't really, I mean, we do it sort of at some level now, but we don't really yet mm -hmm. have a grasp on the impact of how those things are different and, and how, we we can, share, how we can that's meld we share. share what works and what doesn't. Yeah. Yeah, um, I've already been getting notes. John C., one of our longtime viewers, said, I don't even want to wait for the YouTube to go up. Send it to me now. I need to get with my sales team, and we need to start <laughs> talking. So we'll get that together for you, John, and we'll put that together with this white paper that that uh, right, right. Uh, John is going to share as well because, um, uh, you know, I think as we're wrapping up here, we all have an opportunity to bring optimism and excitement into the marketplace. If you talk it down, it will stay down. Okay. Right. I mean, if you stay right. in it, you won't you won't get work because at some point we we need to we need to all find you know where we fit in this and we will. But if we're if we're staying down on it, that that nobody wants to be around that, right? Um, John, do you have any closing thoughts yeah. for us? Let's pick each other up. You know, we're all gonna have good days and bad days going through this. We're all gonna have victories and 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 failures let's you know we, we're an industry that often eats our young let's let's do what you're saying kelly let's stay positive let's stay optimistic let's share more than we've ever done before and let's help each other out check in with each other and make sure everybody's doing as well as can be expected in these difficult times i think if we do that we're going to make it through all this i i, I would agree think, I, I think we should have a little team building right now Mac, I'm going to fall and you catch me. <laughs> you fell the wrong you way, fell the Pete. Wrong way, Pete. Oops. Oops. <laughs> hey, who knew? Who knew? I guess, knew? I guess we've determined that we will not be doing trust falls on TV. Yeah, really. yeah, exactly. There will be a lot of uh, – talk about liability, huh? Um, exactly. And again, the four of you, thank you so much for doing this, for, for dedicating your time and your resources to this. It's so incredibly beneficial for so many people. Uh, and it's and it's really appreciated. And when you figure out the funding of this, Light, Light Switch is in as as a sponsor. We really are. This is cool. Thank really you very cool much, work. John. Thank you. Really it's cool. rewarding to us, and uh, it was it's been a real pleasure uh, interacting with you. Likewise, and great way. Now, now I have a shirt I can wear for weeks. Ten out of ten. Ten out of ten. The, thank God you came on, Jack, because you've been wearing the same freaking shirt for the last five weeks. Oh, so I, know, I, know, talking. I know Pete's an easy buy. He's putting on the shirt by whoever's paying him at that minute. Exactly. <laughs> sort of kind of how it works, but not exactly. Okay. But okay. now, thank you so much, Bruce. Thanks for being on, Mac, Pete. Um, thanks, and John, thanks for a, a lively discussion. And we're going to take all these ideas back and um, – I think we have some cool, cool opportunities to uh, continue this discussion and uh, get uh, get creative and uh, start sharing that. So we'll we'll be looking at that in the weeks to come. So thank you again, everybody. Okay. So long. Thank you all. Have everybody a good be night. Well. Take care. Bye bye. Bye bye. Good night, Bruce. <laughs>